I'm going to wrap things up in this video and we're going to do two things. First of all, we got to look back at the arguments against the description view and see how well does the causal view do in the kinds of cases we thought about. And then secondly, we're going to take a zoom out even further and just see, well, well given all the things that we've talked about up to this point, what are the pros and cons of the various views? So let's start with the first point. This is something I think it's, it's worth emphasizing because it's good philosophical practice. In philosophy, you often see people giving an argument for, for one view over another by saying, well, view X has all these problems, therefore we should favor view Y. One thing you always have to do when you're given an argument like that is assess how well does the new view, view Y, deal with the, with the arguments against the old view. Now Kripke is an extremely good philosopher, so it turns out that the cases he's talked about are very good arguments for his view. But it's something you always have to do, you always have to check and see. Um, are, the, it, are the arguments against one view enough to support the new view? I'm not going to talk about all the different cases, because that would take a long time. I'm just going to take a handful of them. And basically what we'll see is that Kripke's million view seems to make a lot of sense in these kinds of examples. So let's think first about the counterexamples to necessity. So we said that despite the fact that we associate the name Aristotle with properties like student of Plato, great philosopher, taught Alexander the Great, we can say things like Aristotle might never have been taught by Plato, he might never have been the teacher of Alexander the Great, he might never have even been a philosopher, and so on and so forth. If, for example, he had gone off to North Africa in his youth and said, we saw the description theory has a problem in making sense of how it could be sensible to say such things, because according to the description theory, it really should just be sort of part of the meaning of the name, Aristotle, that includes these properties. Kripke, on Kripke's million view, though, things seem to make a lot more sense. Because remember, on the million view, names are just sort of tags for objects. The name Aristotle, all there is to its meaning is it's just, it's just the guy who it picks out. It doesn't in particular attribute any particular properties to him. So if all we're doing is we're using the name to pick out a particular guy, that makes sense of the kind of counterexample to necessity that we saw. When we say things like Aristotle might never be taught by Plato, and might never have taught Alexander the Great, and might never have been a philosopher, we're just using the name Aristotle to focus in on that guy and to say things could have been very different for him. The same thing goes for the Hitler example. On the Millian theory, we're just using the name Hitler to focus in on that guy, and then we can go on to talk about think, how, how he may have lacked all of the most important properties to our minds that he actually had. Since those properties have nothing to do with the meaning of the name, there's really no problem in, in, in understanding how that might be possible on the million view. What about the counterexamples to things like uniqueness or satisfaction or non-existence? Well, let's think in particular about the counterexamples to uniqueness. We saw that there are names where we don't really associate very many properties with those people, certainly not enough to pick them out uniquely. That's not a problem for the million view because that's not how the million view works. It's not like you need a list of properties to determine the reference. All there is is just the referent. The name just is sort of a tag for the person. There of course then is this question of like, well, how are you able to understand the meaning of the name if you don't know very much about the person? But that's exactly where the causal theory of names comes in. Because effectively, Kripke is trying to forestall that objection by saying, well, actually, it turns out on my theory, you just actually don't have to know things or not know very much about people in order to use names for them. You just have to stand in the causal connection in the right way. So take the examples of the names Beethoven and Mozart. We don't know, most people don't know very much about either Beethoven or Mozart, not, certainly not enough to distinguish Beethoven and Mozart from each other. But they're able to use the names correctly because... There's a causal chain going back from their use of the names to like the way the names are introduced by the people who gave Beethoven and Mozart their names. Even the people who don't know very much, they intend to use the names in the same way, and since they're in the right causal relationship, that's why they get to know the meaning of the name. That's why their use of the name picks out that person, even if they don't know very much about them. One way of thinking about what's going on here is that there was a problem about how to understand what's going on when you're using a name for somebody you've never encountered. The Russellian solution was to put more into the meaning of the name, to say the individual must really know more in order to fix their usage of the name. 
What Kripke is doing, he's doing the opposite. He's giving us more of a meta-semantic story. He's saying, well, actually, there's not really very much to the meaning of the name. It's just the person who it stands for. But the reason why you get to use, why you get to understand the name, even if you don't know very much about that person, the reason why you know the meaning of the name, is because there's this thing external to you, the causal relationship between you and the event, the baptizing event where the person got that name. And this is what's going on in all our examples of uniqueness. It's what's going on with Beethoven and Mozart, what's going on with Einstein. And the crucial feature is that like being in the chain, like being in, like we had earlier, you don't have to know any identifying descriptions of the person at the beginning of the chain, the, the thing that is named, in order to pick up on the usage. You just have to encounter other people using the name correctly and basically intend to be using it in the same way. That's all it takes to know the meaning of the name, Kripke thinks. So that's basically what the causal theory would say about the uniqueness cases. That's why we get to know the meaning of the name. That's how we understand what's going on in these cases where we're able to talk about people that we don't know very much about. We saw a bunch of other cases. So we saw, like, we saw arguments against satisfaction and non-existence. Here, the same kinds of things would apply. So for instance, think about the, the Steven Spielberg, Alan Smithy case. Why is it that we're able to say that this is a situation? Like, why, why can we say on the basis of this situation that it could have been that Alan Smithy rather than Spiel, Steven Spielberg directed E.T. and Jurassic Park and so on? The answer, according to the million causal theory, is that, well, because all there is the, to the meaning of the name Steven Spielberg is just that guy, it's not built into the meaning of the name in any way that he directed Jurassic Park or directed E.T. or any of these other things. So it's just completely co coherent to describe the situation in that way. We don't have the problem that the description theory had where it's, it just seems to like the meaning the sentence would have according to the theory just seems to make no sense. But what the theory would say about the non-existence cases is very similar again to what it said about the Beethoven and Mozart case. Whether or not the property we associate with the name really uniquely picks out the person named is irrelevant to what the name means and why it gets its name, and why it gets its meaning, according to Kripke. All there is to the meaning of the name Charles Darwin is just the guy. And the reason why it means that guy is because there's a causal chain going back from our usage of the name to Charles Darwin himself and the event of giving that name to that person. And that's exactly why discovering he was not the only person who came up with the theory of natural selection doesn't mean we then say the name is meaningless, because it's not that property that gives the name its meaning in the first place. And it's not that property that determines that we know the meaning. We don't have to know, and it doesn't even have to be true, that that property picks out that person uniquely for us to know the meaning of the name Charles Darwin. So that's a brief description of how the causal theory understands all these sorts of examples. The reason why these various scenarios are coherent is because there's really nothing built into the name just beyond the person it picks out. That's how we're able to describe them coherently. We're able to make sense of the fact that people know the meaning of the name without knowing very much about the person, because what determines that their, their usage of the name means a particular thing is not really determined by factors that are completely internal to them. It's not just what's going on in their head which determines what the name means. It's rather their relationship between an initial baptism. That's what's really go that's what's really doing the work in determining that a particular usage means a particular person. So the second thing I wanted to do is just sort of see what the scorecard looks like for the various views. We've got a new contender, or a sort of new version of an old contender, because we saw the million view, that was one of the first things we saw in this course. And but thanks to Kripke, it's undergone a considerable resurgence. As a matter of historical fact, the Frege, some version of the Frege Russell theory was like the most popular view up until Kripke. When Kripke gave these arguments, basically everyone sort of became a million in response. But it's worth thinking about, you know, exactly what are the pros and cons of these different views. And one thing that's very important for you guys in thinking about you know, which view you should, you should adopt, is to ask yourselves, well, we saw lots of different arguments for the Frege-Russell view. Does the causal theory, the causal million theory, explain away all the problems that we talked about in previous lectures? Because remember, when we started talking about Frege, 
Frege has various reasons to attack the million view. We saw the problem. We saw Frege's problem. It, lo it really looks like the sentence Superman is Superman means something different from the sentence Superman is Clark Kent. That's a problem for the million view. There's just no mean there's just no difference in the meanings of those sentences, according to the million view. Likewise, there's the problem of empty names. What do you say about a sentence like Santa Claus lives at the North Pole if Santa Claus just doesn't exist? Shouldn't that mean that San the, mean the name Santa Claus is meaningless? And if so, how are you able to use the name to say coherent things like Santa Claus lives at the North Pole if the name is just meaningless? These are problems that Kripke has not solved, at least not yet. And so if you were thinking about the million view and about whether we should we should, we should like the million view, a really important question is what do you say about these problems? Because the reason that people went in for the Frege-Russell view in the first place, or at least one reconstruction of it, is that there were these really serious problems for the million view. You might wonder, indeed, why is Kripke himself so convinced that the description theory is wrong if, his, if, if there are still these outstanding problems for his own picture. I think, broadly speaking, there are two reasons. One is because, as he discusses in other work, he thinks that the Frege puzzle argument and the empty names argument are just not as good as arguments for the Frege-Russell theory as they might have initially seemed. He talks about this more in a, in, a, in a paper called A Puzzle About Belief, which is actually in your textbook. And he talks about empty names in a different book. So, so one reason is just he has other things himself to say about those. But there are also reasons just in the text itself that we read, I think, for why he thinks that even if the, even if the causal million theory has its own problems, it must be a better theory than the description theory. And that, I think, is that he thinks that, well, if you just think about... So remember, we started with this picture of the description that the description theory is founded on, this, like, picture of how naming works. And we saw that, basically, the all the different theses that Kripke was attacking, they sort of derive from this picture. They're all motivated by the, pic, by the picture of how naming works. And what Kripke basically thinks, I think, is that there are just so many counterexamples. The fact that there are just all these counterexamples to all the different theses that were like that seem to come directly from the picture underlying the description theory, just shows that the the picture is fundamentally wrong. There's just something fundamen fundamentally mistaken about the picture that underlies the description theory. Even if there are points in the in its favor, like that perhaps that it solves Frege's problem and that it solves the problem of empty names. The theory is just founded on such a big mistake in the first place that that's not enough to, to, to rescue the theory. The counterexamples show us that the, the view is just unworkable, even if it does have some good features. I think Kripke thinks that nothing like that has been shown for his view. The Frege puzzles and the empty name puzzles, they don't show that that picture is fundamentally flawed in the way that his counterexamples to the theses of the description theory seem to indicate that the description theory is fatally flawed. That's something you guys should think about for yourselves and whether you agree with that assessment. It's a subtle matter when, you know, some theories have, you know, one theory has problems X, Y, and Z, and another problem has, theory has problems A, B, and C, to determine, like, which are the worst problems. And that's something we'll talk about in class. But it's something that you should be very mindful of, that, like, even if Kripke has offered this other theory that doesn't have the problems the description theory has, there are still open questions about what we should say about Frege's puzzle and the puzzle of empty names.